Emily. <laughs> so um, anyway, we'll uh, maybe find that out later on. But I live up in Lisburn with my wife, Gar Ling. She's Chinese Malaysian, hence the, the name uh, is a bit unusual. We have two teenage children, Joseph, who's 15, and Hannah, who is 13. Uh, I started out working life as a doctor. Sometimes people ask, and I don't often put the doctor bit up, except in a subject like this, it's kind of relevant. Um, but people ask, which kind of doctor is it? So I started as a medical doctor, uh, but more recently did a PhD in divinity or theology. Um, so I don't know whether those cancel each other out or kind of multiply, anyway, who knows? So um, I have worked as a medical doctor. I worked with the Chinese church in Belfast for a time. Uh, and uh, was serving there in um, the leadership and outreach to students and youth. Uh, then I worked in Glen Abbey Church for a couple of years, which some of you may be familiar with, with Gilbert Lennox, uh, and then moved into studying for the PhD and worked in Belfast Bible College for six years until three years ago I moved to an organization called Living Leadership, and so my remit now is across the UK and Ireland, building up a network of people who support Christian leaders, uh, give them encouragement, pastoral support, and mentoring. But on the screen, you'll see the name Centre for Christianity and Society. And that is really a group of us here in Northern Ireland with a vision to connect the gospel with contemporary culture. So our desire is to help Christians to think about the issues of our time and to be able to understand and respond faithfully to those, as well as to be doing evangelistic talks and speaking where we can into the media and into the so-called public square from a gospel, biblically-based perspective. So presenting Christianity to those who aren't believers and helping those who are to apply their faith. So that's the, the heading that I've come under this evening. If you're interested to find out more about that, by all means, ask me later or you can check out the website christianityinsociety.org. So I've been asked to speak to, tonight about the sanctity of life, and there's a huge amount that we could cover in this, so I can't possibly do that full justice in 40 minutes or so, um, but I will do my best to give you at least a framework for thinking about these issues, and I'm really happy, uh, John says, I can take some questions if there are any at the end of that time before we move into prayer. Uh, or even just in discussion afterwards, very, very happy to chat to you. Especially, maybe sometimes these things can be personal, might have affected you or someone in your family, and you may prefer to ask a question individually. So I, I'm sure you're aware that the situation in Northern Ireland as regards abortion has changed in a very dramatic way just in the last few years. I don't know if any of you were able to be at the NI Voiceless gatherings up at Stormont or maybe were aware of those. Um, I have been part of the group that organizes those and that was uh, just a couple of years ago. We had a very large gathering there to say that the people of Northern Ireland hadn't been consulted and to speak for the lives of unborn children. But Westminster, as we know, changed our law whilst there was no um, assembly active here and so we have now in Northern Ireland one of the most liberal laws as regards abortion anywhere in Western Europe. So the fact at the moment in Northern Ireland law is that the life of an unborn child has no protection. Okay, so uh, you have this bizarre situation where there are trees, I'm sure there are many around Armagh, that you legally cannot cut down because there's a protection order. There are it is illegal anywhere to cut down bushes whenever birds might be nesting in them. Birds' nests are protected, trees can be protected, unborn children have no protection in law. Uh, it is no longer a crime to end the life of an unborn child. Uh, the other big issue that is facing us but is not yet, the law has not yet changed, is the question of assisted dying. So at the other end of life, the idea that people should be able to get help to end their life, assisted suicide, or perhaps even more than that. So assisted suicide meaning someone chooses to end their own life, but they are unable to do so without some help. And so they might get help from someone to set up a machine or to give them drugs that will um, end their life. Uh, of course, it may go further than that, euthanasia, where someone else takes the action to end someone's life. But at the moment, 
The pressure is on, and there are repeated attempts in Westminster to bring about a change in the law to allow assisted suicide. So that's really to set the context, but where I really want to go this evening is this whole idea of the value of a human life. And as I'm sure you're aware, we live in an age where human rights are talked about a lot, all of the time, even when it comes to abortion. I've been listening to the reporting on the news, which I find quite wonderful that in the USA, it looks like they're about to overturn the ruling that uh, made abortion legal across the USA. But as the BBC has reported on that, they, they repeatedly use the phrase abortion rights may be limited. That is a loaded term saying that a woman has a right to an abortion uh, because it is a basic human right. Now, obviously I would disagree with that, but this idea of human rights comes up in all of these arguments all of the time, as well as in other cultural arguments about gender, identity, sexuality, for example. So the United Nations um, has a document which they describe as the foundation of international human rights law. It is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that declaration was worded in the 1940s, 1948, uh, that came into effect, it was adopted. Probably, if you ask yourself, why in 1948? Why was that the time when people were interested in human rights? Because of World War II, because of what the world had experienced, uh, and particularly as the behavior of the Nazi regime came into to the light, there was a recognition in the global community that there needed to be some standard of human rights that would protect people. And that really is the basis of all human rights laws across the world. Just a quote from the screen, and this is from the United Nations page, it says it represents the universal recognition that basic rights and fundamental freedoms are inherent to all human beings, inalienable, in other words, they can't be taken away, and equally applicable to everyone, and that every one of us is born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's a, a big statement, and it's a statement that I as a Christian, and uh, I suspect you as a Christian, would largely want to say yes and amen to that, this idea that every human life is valuable and that people should have freedom and be treated equally in dignity. So this idea of human dignity is there in the United Nations statement. That's what they put the foundation on, that people have inherent dignity. But of course, as I've said, when it comes to an issue like abortion, you've got a problem because this sign there from pro-abortion people says that abortion is a human right. But here we have a supposed human right from, for the woman, which allows her to take an action that ends another human life. Now the fact is that the United Nations does not have a position that says abortion is a human right. That has been left up to individual uh, nation states. What the United Nations says is that from birth we have dignity. It doesn't then say, but before birth you don't. Okay, So it's not true, even though it was used as an argument when they brought the law into Northern Ireland, that the Human Rights Committee, that one of the UN committees had ruled that abortion should be available. That is simply not true. The United Nations didn't make that rule. Westminster made it for us. But where does this idea of human dignity come from? Well, historian Tom Holland, this book, Dominion, and Tom Holland is not a Christian, he's not writing as a believer, but he does study the question of, of where Western thinking came from, the way we think today. And he says this, that, that human beings have rights, that they are born equal, that they are owed sustenance and shelter and refuge from persecution, these were never self-evident truths. If you go back 2,000 years in Europe, these ideas of basic human rights, equality between people, uh, the, the fact that people are owed 
protection and refuge from persecution were simply not there. The Roman society had slavery. The Roman society abandoned, in fact, people were told that they should abandon disabled babies because they were too costly to, to bring up and they would add nothing to society, put them on the rubbish heap. That's what happened. Roman society thought that it was entertaining at the weekend to go and watch people killing each other, gladiators fighting each other, and of course later Christians even being put to death in the arena. So what changed? Well, it was Christianity, and Tom Holland describes that, that brought into European thinking these ideas of the value of every life. It was when Christianity got a grip, and yes, there was a distortion of Christianity that came with that when it became too strongly linked with the Roman Empire, but when it started to be able to influence the Roman Empire, it was Christians who brought about the end of the abandoning of babies. First of all, they started to take those babies in and raise them as their own and love them, and then they were able to effect a change in the law that meant that that was no longer legal to abandon a baby. It was Christians who did away with that idea of the gladiatorial killing uh, frenzy as a, a source of entertainment. It was Christians who campaigned, and yes, inconsistently, because there were people who professed to be Christians, Later on, he supported the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to America and the Caribbean. But it was also Christians and people motivated by the Christian faith who brought about an end to that trade because they believed in the equality of people. But you don't need to go back to Roman times. You don't need to go back to the 1800s when Britain led the way in getting rid of the slave trade in Europe and North America. You only need to go back, as I've said already, to the middle of the 20th century, when someone like Heinrich Himmler, right-hand man to Hitler, could say, there is nothing particular about man, about human beings. He is just part of this world. And that was a philosophy, a way of thinking about human beings that denied that there is anything special about human beings that says you are just a, a lump of stuff, if you like, a body that is made of the same stuff as, as the world, no particular dignity, no particular value. And it was that thinking that underpinned the racist ideas and the destruction of life that the Nazi regime supported. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we need to realize as Christians and, and we can say honestly to the world around us that when they talk about human rights, when they talk about equality, when they talk about freedom, they are talking our language. These are ideas that came into Europe from Christianity. Now, they've taken a direction in recent times that we would not agree with, but the concepts themselves are Christian ideas. They are biblical ideas. Let me try and explain that as I go on, but I mean simply to say that we as Christians believe that people should be free, that they should be free in particular to make their own response to the gospel. Freedom, we're told to pray in the New Testament for freedom, pray for those in authority that we might live free lives so that we can be godly, or as Peter puts it, so that we can use our freedom to live as servants of God. Freedom is a good thing. It allows people to hear the gospel. It allows people to respond to the gospel. It allows Christians to live faithfully to the gospel. Equality is a good thing if it means that everybody is treated with honor and dignity. But of course, in our time, these things have gone wrong. But let's explore that a little bit more because we're talking here about human dignity. That's what the UN says. But where does that idea come from? Well, where did we come from? Where are we going? And what are we here for? These are three big questions, aren't they, that people might ask themselves or that philosophers might ask about life. And we're really talking here about origins, about purpose, and about destiny. So what does our wider society today believe about where we came from? 
Well, it's this story, isn't it? It's the story of evolution, of mindless evolution. The idea that really a bit like Himmler said, that we are just animals, part of the universe. We kind of are particularly clever animals, but we're nothing more than that. And where are we going to? What do most people in our culture think about that? Well, officially, the only place we know we're going is the grave. Um, well, is that the end? Possibly, snuffed out like a candle. Or maybe people have some sort of vague idea of living on after death, but there's no real clarity, there's no real hope. And if that is true, that we came from nowhere with no particular purpose, and we are going nowhere after we die, well, how do you answer the question what we're here for? Well, there are maybe two ways to answer that. One is we might say, well, I should at least try and achieve something with my life. It's short enough, so I'll try and leave a mark. I'll try and maybe have a, have a family and bring them up and pass something on to them. I'll try and achieve something and get my name in the history books or at least get a name on a gravestone so that somebody remembers me. And of course, for a long time and still today, many people think that way. Although increasingly, and particularly with younger people, that doesn't really wash. Why bother to achieve something if you can't take it with you? Why bother to leave your name behind if it's just going to decay and disappear? The only thing you should really live for is to try and be happy. Pleasure, uh, happiness, feel positive, have a good life, enjoy your life. And you see that value played out. I mentioned earlier sexuality and gender. You certainly see it in those issues. But of course, it also plays out into the issues that we're thinking about tonight. Because when the happiness goes, then it's time just to switch out the lights, isn't it? It's time to just go for the grave and end your life. You can see how that plays out in assisted dying. Or if the happiness is threatened, by a pregnancy at the wrong time, or a child whose needs are such that your life will be inhibited, well, what options do you have there? You see how abortion becomes attractive. But what is a gospel perspective on life? And this is what I want to provide because as Christians, we need to understand that when we're dealing with any specific issue, abortion, assisted dying, any issue that you choose, we're not simply dealing with the question of what is right or wrong in that particular issue. We're dealing with a whole different way of understanding the world, a whole different way of understanding life. And if you believe that you came from nowhere and you're going nowhere, then that changes how you see all of those issues. The, the answer as to what is right or wrong changes because there isn't really any right or wrong if we came from nowhere and if we're going nowhere, there's just try and be happy or try and do what seems good to you, you see. So what does the gospel say about origins? Well, I use a little five-point tool to think about the gospel, and I use five R's. God rules. God created. We don't believe that we came from nowhere mindlessly. The Bible tells us, and we believe, that we have a purpose. The world has a purpose. God created it with purpose. And he created every individual in his image. So we read that right at the outset, Genesis 1, 27. God created humankind in his own image. And of course, as we read on, we can read these beautiful words from Psalm 139 about God knitting together the individual. In other words, it's not just that God created us in his image. God created you. God was involved in your development. God was watching over your life from its very inception. And God has a purpose for each life. Now, of course, someone might say, well, why do you believe that? Well, I believe it because the Bible teaches it, but I also recognize that this fits perfectly with how we experience life. There are a lot of things in our experience that don't fit with the idea that we came from nowhere with no purpose. Maybe 
we could talk about that some other time, about the things in our human experience that point beyond this life. But even if we look at the nature of human life from its very inception, whenever the egg cell and the sperm cell meet, contribution from the mother and from the father meet, even a leading textbook, medical textbook says, a new genetically distinct human organism is formed. Let me walk through those words. This is new. The genetic material that comes together when those two cells combine is new in the truest sense of the word. It has never existed in that combination in the history of the world as far as we understand. Unless you're an identical twin, any of those here? Nope, okay, so unless that's you, there is nobody exactly like you in this world. There never has been, there never will be again. Every single life, truly new. But it's also, so that's the genetically distinct bit, that you have your own distinctive code in the genes of your body. And of course, this life is a human life. It comes from two human parents. So you can't argue that it isn't human, although I've seen people try to do that when they're arguing for abortion. It's not really human. It's a potential human. No, it is human life. That is a fact. And it is a living organism. And I think we could go add a couple of other words in. We can certainly say it is an individual, a human individual. Of course, the big question becomes, is it a human person? And there are people who will try to say, well, it's a it's human, it's living, but it's not a person. And then you've created a category which is a human non-person. That raises all sorts of questions about who else we might put in that category. Because if we put this new life in day one in that category, why do we not put someone with a severe disability or someone whose genetic qualities don't fit our ideal of what is perfect, as the Nazis did? So we're dealing in very dangerous territory if we're going to start talking about human non-persons, human lives that are not persons. But what is going on from day one is absolutely amazing. That picture, okay, so you, you can see how huge the egg cell is. You can imagine the rest of it and how big it is by comparison with the sperm cell that is there. And the fact is that the egg cell is the largest cell in the human body, or in some of our bodies, sorry, men. Uh, this is not applies to us. But in the human body, it is the largest cell. It is the size of a small grain of sand. And in, in terms of cells, that's massive. You can see it with the naked eye, or you could if it could be separated out. Okay, so it is not you have never been microscopic because from day one, all that the man provided, sorry again, men, was just the genetic material from the father's side, but what the mother has provided from day one is energy and nutrition, a cell that is packed full of it, packed full of energy to get this life started, to set it in the direction of growing and developing and the cell multiplying at an immense rate if this carried on developing at the same rate that it does in the first week or two of development, if it carried on growing at the same rate, then women would be giving birth to elephants, okay, which is not a very pleasant thought. So thankfully that rate of growth slows down, but it is utterly amazing at the beginning. And this picture is a, a picture of the insides of a single cell. Okay, sometimes people think this is just, I mean, I, I hear it when people talk about abortion. They say that the unborn child is just a clump of cells, as if that is something insignificant. It is not just a clump of cells. It is a developing human body. But even if you think of one cell, this is a conglomerate of a number of different pictures taken with different technologies. And what you're seeing there, if anybody has any memories of biology at school, this is what they call a mitochondrion, which is the power house. Somebody here works for the electricity or power board or whatever. Well, that's the power house of the cell. Guess where that comes from? Only from the egg. The mum gives the power house to the cells because mums 
from day one give nutrition and energy. They keep on doing it, of course, as the baby develops through the placenta and if they're able to after birth through breastfeeding, that's part of the maternal instinct. And from day one, the mum has provided the energy, the power, even the cells of your body now are powered by this gift from your mum and only from your mum, not from your dad, whether you're male or female. But that's the powerhouse. This is, I think, part of the, what they call the Golgi apparatus, which constructs proteins. So there's like a construction site there. There's all of these other little things. I don't even know what half of them are. But basically, this has been described as being like a city. It's even got a membrane here, which separates it from the other cells. And it's got openings in those which can be opened and closed and let some things in and out and other things not, just like gates of a city. Utterly amazing, from day one. And yet people can think it came from nowhere and happened in a way. This is utterly amazing. So what I'm saying is that this idea that God created us fits perfectly with our experience of life and with what we know from science. But the gospel goes on. If, if God rules and he created us in his image, we rebelled against God. We rejected his rule. We distorted human dignity. Sin had effects on our bodies so that people now are born with disabilities. In fact, I would go as far as to say that all of us at one level or another are born, well, certainly with defects, if we might not call them disabilities. Because sometimes people will say, well, this child is born with a, a disability or inherits this genetic problem. And, so maybe we should have an abortion for that baby. But again, where does that end? Your genes are not perfect. Every one of us in this room have some genes that predispose us to certain diseases, whether diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure. All of them have a genetic element, even cancers. So this idea that we can eliminate the, the, the more defective people doesn't work, does it? We're all defective because of the effect of sin. But we're also defective because our hearts are in rebellion against God and alienated from him. And so we lie and we distort the truth. We know or instinctively that compassion is good. You don't need to be a Christian to feel compassion when you see other people suffering. But compassion becomes misguided so that we come up with the idea that Killing an innocent person might be compassionate. An innocent unborn child, because they will suffer if they're born, and so it's more compassionate to just end their life. Or a person at the other end of life who is dying and suffering, it's compassionate to put them out of their misery. But that is not true compassion. True compassion says that we will put all of our resource and effort into relieving that person's pain and suffering. We will show them love. We will show them their value. We will use all of the great skills that we now have in modern medicine to control some of their symptoms. That's the harder choice for a society and families to make. It's relatively easy to say, no, we'll just end those lives and then get on with our own. And also, we have this idea of autonomy. I said that freedom is a good thing from a Christian point of view, that we should be able to make our own choice in response to the gospel. But we have taken this idea of choice and freedom to a place that is unhealthy. The autonomy idea, the freedom to make my own choice, now includes the freedom of a mother whose body is fighting to sustain the life of her child to take an action that will end the life of her child. Or at the other end of life, that people have the right to choose to end their own life. And of course, there's a great irony in that idea, that if you are suffering at the end of life, you should be able to choose the moment of your death. Because our culture, our society recognizes, and you've maybe seen posters and adverts and and organizations working hard to reduce suicide rates. So we recognize that suicide is a great tragedy, unless, of course, your life is 
too burdensome at the end of life and then it's okay. Well, that doesn't work, does it? Because how do you say to the young person who feels in themselves, my life is not worth living, I just want to die, I want to end it. How do you convince them that that's not true if there are some people whose lives aren't worth living? So do you see how these good values of compassion and freedom have been misguided in our culture? Just want to be absolutely clear, scripture is very clear about this, that killing an innocent human being, so we could have a discussion about capital punishment and about war, we don't have time to do that, but certainly there is no question in scripture that an innocent human being, including oneself, it would be wrong, it would be sinful to kill. Now that is not to say that a person who takes their own life has committed somehow an unpardonable sin. That idea has gone around uh, really coming from Roman Catholic theology because that has the idea that you can die outside the state of grace. If you die having sinned without having confessed it um, to the priest and received absolution, then you can't go to heaven. And so if you take your own life, that's a mortal sin. And of course, by definition, you can't confess it, so you can't go to heaven. But that's not the biblical teaching on salvation. Okay, So a person who is a true believer in the Lord Jesus in a moment of depression or despair may end their own life, but the Lord Jesus holds on to them. Of course, the other question on this, though, is when we think about death, why is it that human beings die? Well, when we read in the Bible, God didn't create us for death. He created a garden, the Garden of Eden, and he gave us access to the tree of life. And as long as Adam and Eve ate from that tree, they would live forever. When it comes to Genesis 3 and they have sinned, they have rejected God, God says, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. God put them out of the garden to keep them away from the tree of life. God brought death into their experience or withdrew the means to allow them to live forever. But why did God do that? Was it a judgment? Well, yes, in one sense it was a judgment. But if you read this verse, I think it hints or points us to something else, doesn't it? What would happen if you or I were allowed to live forever as we are now? But you would keep on sinning, wouldn't you? You would keep on messing up things. The fact is that a human being as we are now, affected by sin, cannot live forever. In fact, our universe can't exist forever. Even if there was only one of us, eventually we would use up all the energy. Okay? All of our efforts to save the environment might make it last a bit longer, but in the end of the day, the energy is going to run out. It's all getting worn down. So we can't live forever in this universe, which is decaying, and we can't live forever in these bodies, which age and get older and eventually get worn out. Uh, But God doesn't want us to live forever. Why? Because it is through death that God calls us back to himself. It is the awareness of death often that makes people think about what comes after, about eternity. And coming to terms with our death is often the thing that focuses us on living a better life, a life for the purpose that God intended. But not only that, of course, it is after death that God will bring the judgment. And so we need to be very live to this, that death is not just an end to suffering and then that's it and no more. Death is returning to God and facing the creator and judge of our souls. And so we as Christians, well, where do we find purpose in life? Well, we find it in this, that we rebelled against God's rule. God rules, we rebelled, but God rescues. There is love, the love of God. There is forgiveness for sins. There is eternal life a new quality of life that is never-ending as well in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that he entered into death. When it comes to the harder side of questions about life and suffering and death, and we say, well, does God care about any of it? We could have an interesting discussion, couldn't we, about some theoretical God who might not actually care. But you couldn't possibly have that conversation about the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, could you? Because you can't look at Jesus and say there is someone who doesn't care, who doesn't understand. Here is God entering into our suffering and through death bringing our salvation from sin and through his resurrection bringing hope. And when we look at the incarnation of Jesus, if you want to know for certain that human life has immense value, a value that no other life on earth, whether it's a tree or a frog or your pet dog, that no other life on earth has. Just look at the incarnation of Jesus. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby in Elizabeth, the brephos in the Greek, leaped in her womb, Luke 1. And in Luke 2, and this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby brephos, same word. Do you notice that? wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The baby in the womb, the baby in the manger, the same word, not a different thing. We've come up with different words, fetus, embryo, baby. But the Bible doesn't make that distinction. It's the same, same thing. Just as you are the same you that you were on day one, you've grown a bit, you've changed a bit, you're still growing and changing. Most of you not growing upwards, some of us growing outwards. But all of you are developing socially, intellectually, and spiritually by God's grace. That doesn't stop when you're born. It doesn't stop when you stop growing in your body, does it? Every life has value, and that is true from day one. But the value of humanity rests on this fact that God became human. He didn't become incarnate as some other species, but as a human being. And because God's children are human beings, Hebrews tells us, uh, and I've used the New Living just simply to make it easier to understand uh, without the context, but because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son of God also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. It's beautiful truth. And this is the gospel truth that we have. But the fourth point in the gospel, God rules. We rebelled against him. God rescues through Jesus. We must respond. We are called to repent, to turn away from sin, to believe, and to obey. And Christians are the living dead. And this is really important as we think about the question of death. Because we have been buried, the Apostle Paul says, with Jesus by baptism into death. The old self in rebellion against God is dead. But we're raised with him to a new life. And so we can say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. At least we ought to be able to. Yes? So we have a different perspective, not only on death, but on life itself. A different perspective on the purpose of life. Life is not simply for me to try and achieve something. It's not for me to try and stay happy. It is for me to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him and to make him known. And therefore, I want to live for as long as he wants me to live for. But when the time comes to die... I don't have to fight against that because that's his time for me to die. The problem that our world has is that they want to live for a different purpose and they want to put off death and fight against death as long as possible. But then some say, but when it's inevitable, why not just embrace it and get help? That's a very different approach because they have a different belief about where we came from and where we're going. God rules, we rebelled, God rescues, we respond. That's not the end of the story. The story doesn't end with us. The gospel begins with God, it centers on God in Christ, and it finishes with God who restores. 
There is hope and help in this life and beyond by the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who will restore all things. This whole world will be restored, a new creation where we can live forever, new resurrection bodies that won't age and decay and be prone to disease and death. Real hope beyond death, but also hope and help now. And the Spirit of God brings that hope to us individually, but more often, directly, more often he brings it through the people of God, the community that is the church, as we support and love one another. And so Christians, how do we respond to these issues and these pressures in our culture? Well, we must honor every person in our words and in our actions. We must celebrate the value of every life. We mustn't get into the despair that says some lives are not worth living. We must be people who say every life is precious. Every person, the most disabled person, we must embrace them. The unwanted children. Yes, unborn children, but also children in the care system. Uh, and at the end of life, we can be there in our words and our actions to give compassionate care within the church to one another, loving each other as the family of God, and as we're able, as Ephesians tells us, or Galatians rather, to those who are not believers. First of all, in the family of faith, but as we're able, caring for people outside. But we also have to share the hope of the gospel. We have to engage in conversations of grace and truth. Grace that holds out forgiveness. Grace that is not about condemning people, but truth that is real about the value of life and about the reality of sin and the fact that we live with a Lord, the Lord Jesus, and we follow him. And so we need to learn to speak about these issues and not to be afraid to do that, not be afraid to humbly and gently simply testify to what is true, that abortion is a great sin. And there are no exceptions to that, by the way. It's a great sin, what, however that child was conceived, whatever disability that child has, to actively end that child's life is a great sin. Even to save the mother's life, there is no need to actively end the life of the baby. You can deliver the baby and sustain its life as far as you can. Even though you know it can't live, you still treat it with dignity. You don't kill it actively, you see. And of course, we too can prepare for a good death. And I would urge you on this. I've said already that as Christians, we don't have to fight for life till the very last moment. There is a time and there comes a time when it is okay to say, I think the Lord is calling me home. And so it's time to say no to future medical treatment. It's time to say no to resuscitation, perhaps if, if I, they think my heart might stop. It's okay to say, you know, I don't have to be resuscitated. It might be okay to say no to some treatments, for example, uh, for, for cancer, if there is no real hope that that will save your life. It's a different thing if it might save your life. But if it's a decision between a shorter life with better quality and a slightly longer life with a worse quality, you as a Christian might say, Lord, I want to have the better quality for a shorter time so that I can be prepared with no unfinished business. And this is the challenge, to say that death will come to each of us unless the Lord comes again first. We know that. There's no point denying it. It doesn't help us in any sense if we deny it, hard as it might be to think about it. But actually to, to know that may allow us to be well prepared, to be right with God, to be running the race, fighting the good fight, so that when the time comes, keeping good relationships, loving others, making sure we don't have rifts that are unhealed, so that when the time comes, there will be no unfinished business and we go home to be with the Lord. So just to recap, that what I've really said is this, the gospel gives us three roots for human dignity. In the past, we are created in the image of God. In the future, every person has the potential of living eternally with God. And in the present, we know that Christ loved us, God loved us enough for Christ to die for us. I think those might also be related to faith, 
trusting that even though we find ourselves a bit bruised and battered, that we were made and loved by God. Hope for the future and love in the present. Faith, hope and love. If you do want to read more, you can check out the website of the centre. NI Voiceless uh, is planning to have an annual event to commemorate lives lost to abortion. We had one just a few weeks ago. Uh, you may want to check that out. And my own website is there if you want to get in touch with me or check out some papers that I have there. But are we okay to take a couple of questions uh, if anyone has? Any, anyone want to ask any questions? I realize there's a lot we could talk about. Maybe I've sparked some thoughts in your mind, but if there are any questions for clarification or things you would like me to say a little bit more on, I'm happy to do that. I hope the approach I've taken of trying to give us a foundation rather than just deal with the issues is helpful, but obviously the issues themselves raise lots of questions too. But, John, I, I'm guessing. <laughs> Yes. And, and I, I accept that is very difficult. And we do live in a, in a world now, especially in social media, which I know you're talking about a real conversation face to face, but in the social media world in particular, people look for sound bites, quick, short comments. And some of these things just can't be answered that way. So I think it depends on the nature of the relationship. If you know the person well, and they respect you, and you've built up some respect with them, then, and they say something like you say to them, look, we can't just answer this here on the street passing by or wherever let's let's get a proper sit down and, and let me just talk that through with you and i'll explain and start i would then try and present it in the way that i have done with as a gospel issue if you like explaining so in other words we're explaining not just what we believe but why we believe it that it's not just i believe this because when when you say i believe abortion is wrong well for starters you and i We'll get the answer, well, what would you know? You don't have a womb, okay? But even the ladies amongst us will maybe get the answer, well, that's all right for you because you never were faced with the question or a tough situation. Because people think that's all that ethics boils down to. It's what's right for you. But you're trying to explain to them, no, I, I believe there are certain things that are absolutely wrong. And I think on the abortion issue, actually, even if somebody doesn't accept a Christian way of understanding the world, even showing them the, the, the reality of what an unborn child, I haven't done that, but the development of an unborn child, even the complexity of a single cell. Because around abortion, there are a lot of lies. There are NHS videos for women thinking about having an abortion that use language like saying the pregnancy will be removed. And that's just, just wrong. That A pregnancy is a condition that a body is in that can be ended, but it, you're not removing the pregnancy, you're removing something else. Quite horrifically, there was a, a very senior healthcare person um, at the top of one of the healthcare bodies who said abortion is a simple procedure, it's just like getting a bunion removed. Now, she meant that the, the risks to the mum are as little as that, and that may be true, although that may be debatable, but of course it's, it's, it's equating two very, very different things. And so trying to get to the truth of that. But I think the other thing I would say is that on any of these issues, what I want to do is as quickly and as clearly as possible bring it to Jesus. Um, because I, I don't want to give people the impression I've got a good answer because I'm a clever person or I've got a good answer because you know, I went to some class where somebody told me this or whatever it is. I, I want to say, look, the reason we see this differently is because I have a Lord, the Lord Jesus, and I, I am loyal to him, and I follow what he says. And the reason I would go there is that I think people find it much harder to argue with him than they will to argue with you. And that will throw them to say, okay, well, well really, did Jesus say anything about this? And you can say, well, 
he did talk about the value of little children who weren't valued in the culture of his time. He treated people with leprosy who were outcasts with value. He restored lives. He put them back together. And when it says that he was a little baby lying in the manger, which they've almost certainly heard in a nativity, it's the same word that was used for unborn babies. In other words, Jesus was a, was a fetus once. Imagine that. So you're, but there you're getting to the heart of the gospel. So that's, that's a, a little bit of a tip. But I think, I think above all, we've got to be gentle. The last thing that we need to do is to come across with the placarding and the condemnation. Because the Lord Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And our message is one of, of truth and grace, or grace and truth. So we have to be clear on the truth. We have to testify to what is right and to what sin is. That's one of the biggest challenges in our current moment. But we've also got to point to the grace of God, that there is forgiveness for the woman. And it may be in a room, uh, even in a room like this, there could be somebody who's been affected personally by this. That we need to hold out that message that there is forgiveness for every sin through faith in the Lord Jesus. We're not here to condemn. We're here to, to bring grace, but we're also here to help. And so meeting our words with practical help where we can. So those are some of the things I would say, John. Yep. Any other questions? Um, yes, there is some evidence around that. Um, one of the harder issues in abortion that people often quote, and these things were quoted in Northern Ireland about so-called fatal fetal abnormality, babies that will be born with a disability or might not live long. I don't think that's a good argument for abortion because you can care for those babies and do what any mum does and sustain their life. But the other one was, was um, pregnancy through rape or incest, which are very difficult situations. But in those hard cases, whether it's a baby with a, an abnormality or whether it's a pregnancy through rape, for example, you cannot undo the pain. You can't undo the crime if it's sexual crime and the trauma of that. You cannot undo the, the, the pregnancy, the hope that the parents had when they first knew they were pregnant and then realized this baby has an abnormality. So the idea that abortion somehow fixes it is just, it's just wrong. It doesn't. The only thing that you can do is to make the choice to do the best thing that you can to uphold human dignity, in which case you carry on with the pregnancy and make sure that there's good care around that person. And in the case of rape or incest, perhaps put the baby up for adoption. But the reason I'm saying that in this, in this question is that there is, um, I think, very clear evidence that women who became pregnant through rape were followed up afterwards. Some had abortions, some didn't uh, in the USA. And amongst those who had abortions, many of them regretted that. But amongst those who kept the baby, none of them did. Okay? So in terms of the long-term outcome for the mum, uh, I think it stands to reason that there will always be that niggling doubt, that question, did I do the wrong thing if you've had an abortion? Whereas if you know that you have sustained that baby's life and loved it as long as you could, even if it ends in a short life or adoption or whatever, then you, you don't have that shame. But the problem with the mental health argument is that how people report their, it, there are two questions. One is what do we mean by good mental health? And that's a complex question. There are at least six different ways to define good mental health. And increasingly in our culture, the number one way is I feel happy, okay, which is I think not the best way but it is the number one way. Uh, and the problem with that is that if you, if, if you have people around you who will call the baby a clump of cells, who don't show you even though they will do an ultrasound before you have the abortion to make sure it's a, you're pregnant, they won't, they'll say to you, don't look if you don't want to. In other words, they discourage you from actually seeing what's really there. So you've built up this idea, it was just a clump of cells, it was only a wee thing, lots of people have had it. Uh, society approves of it, it's not against the law, many of those women will not feel guilty. Do you, do you see what I mean? Because they're believing those things. And that's why I would say the mental health argument, it is there, but it's not a strong argument. The, the real question is, what is the value of this life, this unborn life? So yes, uh, but I wouldn't, that's why I don't major on that, because it's, 
ultimately it becomes a question of principle. What is right and what is wrong? What is this like? Okay, and the, the other thing, just say it, please, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, to have the abortion. Right, okay, okay, yeah. Right. And that is, you know, again, it's very hard to know for certain about what goes on if somebody is talking with someone in private, you know, but certainly my understanding is that there are, well, there are situations where people feel that pressure because the people around them are saying it's okay, it's not a problem. Actually, one of the problems we have is that there is no protection for a woman now if, for example, their partner or husband puts pressure on them to have an abortion. Um, you know, and obviously he can't force her to, but if he's putting pressure on, because the baby's life has no protection, no crime has been committed if she has the abortion, and therefore he hasn't done anything wrong in inciting that. Do you see what I mean? So, yes, we're putting, no, I understand that in this case, yeah. And, and understandably, she, it was her child, and that love, I, I mean, those of you who have been parents, and especially if you've been a mum, I can't understand that from the inside of being a mum, but it is natural from the moment you know that you're gonna have a child, that you have hopes, you start to love it. To get a diagnosis to say that this baby has something wrong or might not live long or might be disabled, that is, is awful. Of course, it's a terrible thing to bear. But then in that moment to then feel that you're under pressure to end that baby's life and then afterwards wonder what if. That, how, how is that better than if the medical profession is coming around and saying, we will care for this baby, we will support you, and if the baby is born uh, dead or lives a short life or is born with a disability, we will treat him or her with the same dignity that we would any human being. That's what I think is the most dignified thing, and it's what um, upholds the value of all of our lives. No, no, it sounds like they didn't, and I'm, I'm sorry about that, but... But you can see how in our context now, where, where actually there's no protection for the baby, these things then become the pressure. And that's the other thing to say when it comes to the end of life as well. People say, well, look, all you're doing is giving people a choice. Nobody's forcing you to have your life ended. But when is a choice ever really free from pressure? So once you say to somebody, if you choose to, you can choose to have help to end your life. And you have a person who's getting older who loves their children, who feels that they are a burden on their children, who thinks, well, if I was out of the way, they wouldn't have to spend time caring for me and they might even get a bit of an inheritance or whatever. That, is that really a free choice? You see, what we're doing is saying to people that it's okay for you to decide your life has no value. Whereas the current law around the end of life says, no, your life has value. It's never right or good to end that life and we won't assist you to do so. We'll care for you in theory but we know there are lots of gaps in that. And I have to say one last thing on that. One of the best things we could do in our society is to improve the standard of palliative care. So when we know that when there is good palliative care, good care for people towards the end of life, people are much less likely to ask for help to end their lives um, because their symptoms are controlled and because they're treated as people and given value and cared for. In, in a hospice setting, for example, or with palliative care nurses in the home. Um, and, and when they surveyed uh, doctors in the UK to ask them whether the professional body for physicians, so up to a while back they had a, an opposition to a change in the law on assisted dying. They are now neutral on the issue officially because they didn't have a majority, although the biggest number were still saying we should be against it. but because it was no longer over 50%. Some were neutral, some said, no, we should change the law, so they, they now have a neutral position overall. But when you look at the voting, the one specialty where there was a very clear vote against, against changing the law and saying we should not allow assisted dying was amongst palliative care specialists. 85%, I think, said no, no change in the law. And they're the experts, they're the ones who know what is possible. So I think that can give us some hope that there can be good care. 
But as I said, I think for all of us to prepare for our death, and part of that is to talk to our loved ones as well about what, what we want, you know, what treatment would we want? When would we think that it's enough? And the reason I say that is because it's much easier for your loved ones if they know what your wishes are, if they know you've had that conversation. That means they're not in the position where they have to make the choice if you lose consciousness or um, you know, if you were to develop dementia, for example. So better, even though it seems strange, to have those conversations relatively early and actually make that clear and then, then have a sense of, well, well, when the time comes, I'll be ready to, to let go. Hard as that is, I don't find that easy. But um, I think that is better for us if we can. I don't know whether we need to move on into prayer. I don't want to keep you from prayer. And I'm sure there's much to pray about these issues. But I, I'd be really happy to talk to anybody after that as well. So I'll, I'll hand back to Timmy for now. Thanks.